Hey everybody, Spence here again. Uh, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to go over how to scan large format film. I also will touch on 35 and 120 film scanning if you need that. This is the last one in our little three-part series. The first part we did was we went to the old gas station and took that photo. Then in the second part we went ahead and developed the film. And now this is the last part so you can kind of see the end of the process. So I hope you enjoy this and I hope you get some good information out of it. So the first thing I'll talk about is the scanning equipment that I use. Um, I don't have room for a dark room, so this is kind of how I was able to get into large format photography without having a large footprint or a dark room. Uh, you guys heard about the changing tent. I use that for swapping the film in and out, loading cassettes and things like that. But for actually making prints, um, I have to digitize it, and then I do use uh, software to work on it. So first things first. So what do I use for scanners? So here is the Epson Perfection V600. I have owned this scanner. Actually, I have the V500. It worked very, very well for me. This one will do 35 millimeter and 120. It will do uh, black and white and color as well as negatives and transparencies. So it goes up to 6400 DPI. Um, I've used this in the past for galleries that, for example, somebody um, say back in the 60s that shot some black and white film and they wanted to have a, a gallery showing so they brought me their 35 millimeter film and I scanned it and I was able to make 16 by 20s and then the gallery of course framed them and hung them up and did the show so that was, that was really uh, pretty great uh, as you can see this has got a lot of good reviews on it so 1700 reviews four and a half stars uh, the price if we click on it, I think it's about $200. Yeah, so you're right around two, 204 So that's not too bad, really, if you consider everything that this will do for you. Uh, we'll also, of course, do prints. But this has a transparency lid in it, so that way um, it has the bulb in the top as well. So that's what makes it allow, allows you to scan the film with transparencies with it. Now, the other thing is when I started thinking about getting into large format, um, Thinking about scanners, I was looking at wet scanning, dry scanning, and I heard about these things called Newton rings, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So this is actually what I bought, and it's the Epson Perfection V800. There is an 850. What's the difference between the 800 and the 850 if you don't know? The 850, for about $300 more, you get an extra set of film holders, and there's a software called uh, Silverfast. And for the life of me, I could not get it to work. I've called the company, I looked online, tried to get, tried to, get to work, and I come to find out a lot of other people are also experience, experiencing these same problems. So what I'm actually using to scan is the Epson scanning software that came with it, and it's working fine for me. So, um, and I do my post in, in uh, Elements right now, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So anyway, so that's, that's what I use as far as the scanner has worked well for me. It does go up to 6400. This will also do 35 millimeter, 120, 4x5, and 8x10. And here you can see that this also has four and a half star reviews, um, 109 of them. So you might want to go and check this out. And this one I want to say is right around 650 or so was the last time I checked. Oh, it's going up a little bit. All right, so we're at 724. So still, for me, if you're going to get into scanning your own film, if you're going to get into this and you need a way to digitize it, I would definitely check out one of these scanners and see what you guys think. So now as far as the software I'm using, I do have Photoshop CS5. I'm sorry, but I refuse to pay Adobe to a monthly fee uh, to, to use Photoshop. So actually, um, since I'm a photo instructor here in Southwest Florida, I teach Photoshop Elements. That's what a lot of people use. It's affordable. You pay once and you're done. So uh, that's what I've been using is Photoshop Elements. It does everything I need it to do. And I'm going to step you guys through the process. You'll see I don't make a lot of edits to my, to my uh, finished photos. The big thing is, is the dust and scratches. Obviously, I'll go through and I'll fix any little, any little hairs or dust or anything that gets in there that needs to be fixed. Um, I am looking into another company. It's from a company called Serif, and they have a product called Affinity Photo. And what they're offering is they have a Photoshop-like program 
that you pay a one-time fee for right now as of this video it's $49 and you pay once and you're done there's no it's not a monthly recurring fee it's not a subscription and it works on both Mac and Windows and it taps into your specific computer's hardware which is nice so like the graphics cards and things like that so that looks really really exciting so I'm gonna look into that all right so we'll go ahead and we'll put this web page away here for a little bit and I went ahead and prepped some things here for us now I'm here at the college so I don't have all my stuff with me but I went ahead and already scanned the one piece of film and just scanned it so then you guys will see what I see when we when we get rolling one thing I found actually two things I found when I started doing the scanning that you guys should be aware of is the first thing is called Newton rings because they don't make a carrier for the, the Epson does Epson scanner does not make a carrier for the 8x10 film you put the 8x10 film directly on the scanner glass so sometimes what can happen is you'll hear these things called Newton rings and Newton rings the best way I can try to explain is if you've ever dropped you know, if you take a, a couple of drops of water and you put it into a cup, you'll see like the rings start to come out of the little ripples. That's kind of what a Newton ring looks like, and it can show up on your film. Now, knock on wood, I can say that uh, I have not encountered any Newton rings with this because that was one of the things I was worried about. So I have used Ilford's Delta 100 and their FP4 Plus, and I've not had any problems with these Newton rings. So my scans have come out clean. I'm printing 40 by 50 images all day long from them. So all good stuff. Now the other thing you may run into, and I have it up here, is I was trying to scan my film at like at 6400 DPI, my 8 by 10s Of course the smoke was rolling out of the back of the scanner. It was like, what are you doing to me? And a box came up and basically said the image size is too large. Please fix your document and try again. And I'm like, well, fix it. What does that mean? So I did some digging in the Epson uh, FAQs which can be kind of scary if you've ever tried that with any of those big companies and here's the answer so basically as you can see it has a maximum pixel count of 21,000 by 30,000 and uh, believe it or not uh, the way I'm going to show you what I do I'm pretty close to that a number actually so anyway so that is something else that you should be aware of that the scanner does have a pixel limit to it if you need something ultra, ultra high res scanned, you might want to try drum scanning. And that's where you can send them out to labs across wherever it is you're, you're watching this from, see if they have them. They're becoming really scarce simply because the machine has to be maintained. You got to have somebody who knows what they're doing to get it on there. It's actually got to be wrapped around like a acrylic drum. Uh, there's all these different things. It's a very specialized process. I was in commercial printing for 20 years and some of the print shops that I dealt with, they had um, a drum scanner. And back in the day, those things were not cheap. They were like a $30,000 machine. It was ridiculous. So anyway, so there are some people that still do it if you need that. But I'm telling you, for me, with the, uh, those two films, I'm easily, and my, my printer is an Epson 9880. It's a 44-inch wide printer. Um, it's about 10 years old, but it works great. I'm getting great prints out of it, so... Anyway, we'll, we'll get into that later. All right, so anyway, so this is the first little caveat I just wanted to let you guys know about this um, image size being too large. So now what we'll do is we'll take a look here at the actual scanning software. So again, like I mentioned, the Silverfast did not work for me. So this is what I've been using is the Epson scan. So this is just a screenshot because, again, I'm here at the college right now. But we can definitely see how this works. So the big thing is right here where it says film type, Right, document film type, you want to choose the film area guide, or if you're going to be doing 35 millimeter or 120 or even 4x5 with the 850 or the I'm sorry, the V800, there's another choice where it says film with um, document or film loader. So you're going to want that. And then the film type, of course, you'll pick from the list, which will be black and white negative film, is it positive uh, film, which is your transparency. Um, anyway, so you can pick whatever it is you need in that list. Now down here, this is where you've got image type. So you have a choice of 8-bit and 16-bit grayscale. I always scan my stuff at 16-bit grayscale, just so I can get as much um, information as possible. If you're doing color, you have the choice of 24 
bit or 48 bit color. So if you're obviously going to be working with uh, some kind of color product, that might be something you might want to look at. Now the resolution. So I'm using 2400 because that's about the limit that I can get out of my 8x10. The optical, optical resolution of this scanner is 6400. So yes, there'll be a higher number that you can stick in there, but it's fake resolution. The machine is just guessing and trying to get you there. So if you want the optical resolution 6400, uh, that's really handy if you're doing 35 millimeter or 120. If you're doing 4x5, you might only need 4800 DPI. Um, for 8x10, 2400 is about the limit. So let me show you why. So if we come over here for a minute, here's my preview scan window. And I'll show you this here full screen in a minute. So you can see it's about 85 by 10 And right here it is in pixels. So I'm at 19,000 and change by, we'll say, we'll call it 24,000 to keep the math easy. Now you got to remember, the limit of the scanner is what, 21,000 by 30,000? So I couldn't even go to 4,800 for me, 4,800 DPI, because it would be over what it would allow. And I'm already at almost 900 megabyte file. <laughs> so that's... That's nice and big. That, that should work. All right, so back over here for a minute. All right, so document size, that's just what I selected, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the target size, original, fine. Now here's the other big thing. Some people, you watch what they're doing, and they will set the white point and the black point in the Epson scanning software. I don't do that. I just want a plain scan, leave it alone, because my thought is, a company like Photoshop or Adobe or Serif, their product is built for image manipulation. Epson's software is built more for grabbing your, your raw stuff and taking it somewhere else and doing something with it. So I've turned off all of this stuff. Um, anyway, the sharpness, the, the, the levels and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I do. And so you'll notice all this business is turned off. So it's all grayed out. And then over here, let me just back out here for a minute. You can see how when you click on preview down here in the bottom left, it will then give, allow you to select your photo. So here it is. Here's the actual scan, preview scan, I should say, of the uh, gas station. And that's how it came up with a size of 7.95 by 9.91. So I was off just a little bit. That's fine. Uh, so then basically what we do is we'll hit scan and then the next box is going to come up before it actually scans. And you're going to get this box right here. And what this is going to do, it's going to ask you, first of all, where do you want it to go? So it's either going to be uh, in your documents folder, pictures, other. I always put them on the desktop and then I move them to my external hard drives. That's what I do. And of course, if you want you're set to your IMG is the prefix, but you can of course can change that. And this is the counter. So if you're doing a whole roll of film, you know, it just keeps counting up. Now here's something else that I do that may or may not work for you. When I was in commercial printing, we loved TIFFs. TIFFs is a non-destructive file format. So every pixel that you get is gonna, you can keep it. It's not like a JPEG where every time you save a JPEG, you're throwing away data. In this case, we'd be creating a JPEG, but um, I try to, I stick with TIFFs all the time. So I have it set to TIFF, and I also have the compression to none. So I want the biggest, heaviest file possible. And because again, I'm thinking I've got to print for me a 40 by 50 image of this. So I want the most amount of data I can possibly get. So again, I use TIFFs. And this other stuff down here, overwrite any files with same name. I don't have that checked. Show this dialog for the next scan so I can make sure in case I need to change the location. Open image after scanning. I don't do that because I'm going to open it up in my other software anyway. And then show the add page dialog after scanning. Um, okay, fine. I be honest with you, I'm not even sure what this is. It doesn't come up. So basically I hit okay. Then what's going to happen is the Scanner will start to, you know, light up and do its thing. Uh, for me, it initially says 15 minutes, and then it will instantly cut back to about seven to eight minutes. So that's not bad considering we're scanning eight by 10 negative at 2400 DPI. And it's, it's just, to me, that, to me that's fast. So, 
Alrighty, so now let's take a look at um, our negative and see what our scan looks like. So here it is, it's called IMG192, and so I'm just going to open that up in Elements here real quick. And I'm using Elements 13, it's a little long in the tooth. Uh, Elements 2018 is now currently out as we record this, so I should probably uh, look at up upgrading this, but it's worked well for me. You know, I'm kind of like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So everything's working. When everything's working, we're happy. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. I like to use Camera Raw to set my white point and my black point and to just crop off the little crummy edges that didn't quite, you know, uh, the edges of the film holder. So how we do that in here, and by the way, if you're doing this in Photoshop, you could do file. Um, they may have an open a Camera Raw as well now. I don't, I've not seen CC, so I can't say for sure, but they may have an open a camera raw as well. If they don't, you can always do open in Photoshop and then under the file type, change it to camera raw and then it will open it. That's how we used to do it years ago. That was our workaround. So, all right, so I'm just gonna click on our, on our scan here and the camera raw. There we go. Now considering this is a 900 meg file, this is pretty zippy. So you're gonna go, wow, Spence, this is great. This this looks awful. <laughs> what did you do? So this is generally the way most of my negatives look. Um, I don't know if it's because of the scanner or what it is, but this is basically what I get to get started with. And if we look at the histogram over here, you'll see that you know the data is kind of down in this area. And we need to spread it over here. And I think some of this has to do because it's the pyrocat that's trying to um, keep everything in tone. Obviously, this is very very much in tone, but um, according to the exposure, and the negative doesn't always look like this. It looks like it should, so it might be something a little bit in scanning process, even though I turned it off. And of course, I've turned off all that extra stuff that was in the Epson scan, so we get to do it here. But never fair, no problem. All right, so basically the first thing that I'm going to fix is the white point and black point. I find once you do that, the rest of it kind of falls into place. So down here, what we have is our white point and black points right here, whites and blacks. Now I could, as you can see, if I want to open it up, which I need to, I would move this white slider this way. However, if I just start moving this, yes, I can watch the histogram, but here's another tip before I start doing that. If, I, if you press and hold down the Alt key, which is on PC or Option on the Mac, and then start moving the whites, it will turn completely black. And then as we move the whites way over here, when, you see how this white stuff is starting to show up? That is going to be the whitest white. So basically that's how we're going to set our white point. So I'm just going to back off just to, just to scotch on that there a little bit. I'm not so much worried about the edge as I am the actual interior of the frame. Because if you guys remember, we had full sun out here on this. Um, this is the grass outside. So that's something I want, want to keep an eye on. So there's our white point. You can see it already looks immensely better. Now let's do the same thing with our black point. So I'll just press and hold that Alt or Option key and see if I can move that over a little bit now. See, that was pretty darn close. So that one I'm not have to do a whole lot of messing with. I don't mind having, you know, obviously pure whites and pure blacks in my image because this is a black and white photo. So it should have something in there, right? Um, now, as far as you're seeing the blue, so that's my shadow warning. I'm not worried about that. In fact, let's just go ahead and turn that off for a minute. There we go. Now you can see the edges here. Let me just go ahead and zoom in on something here. You can kind of see this is the edges of the film holder. So that's about, that's the only thing I really crop is the edges of that, you know, there, there's no sense having that. So I'm just gonna go over here and make sure that this is set to normal and I don't have any other aspect ratio clicked. And then I will just go ahead and draw a box. I'm sure everybody has cropped before. If you haven't, you should try it, it's all the rage. <laughs> So we'll just go ahead and I'm just going to just take just the edges off. Here you can kind of see how that works. Nothing too hard here, nothing, not, not too much rocket science. And also what's nice is if you're straightening your images and trying to get it a level in the camera, there's very little cropping here so you get to use, you know, 99.9% .9 of the negative. All right, so I'm going to hit enter or return and there we go. So we trimmed off our edges, so that's cropped. Um, then the other thing I might check, you know, if I wanted to play with the exposure a little bit, if I said, okay, maybe I might want to lighten that up a little bit just to see what that looks like. 
that is my highlight warning trying to tell me hey you, you know you're you're getting close there so I could always come back to my whites and press and hold that alt or option key and just bring that back a little bit and we'll see what that looks like and you know it's not too bad I do have this preview checkbox up here um, which is in the older software and the newer software you don't have this box there's a little like Y down here but what one key that works no matter what the software is as far as it's if it's Photoshop or elements if you hit the P key is in preview it will show you there's the before that we just did uh, a few minutes ago and there's after so you know that's pretty amazing so I could live with that and by the way just to you know we're seeing this whole image and I'm on a 15 inch uh, Mac laptop and we're only seeing 6.5% of this. So if we just got crazy and say, let's look at part of it at 100%, I'm gonna grab the hand tool. Uh, look at all the detail, like here's the nail head and then here's all this crummy paint that's just coming off. I mean, it has so much character. This is amazing. It's just, I mean, look at this. Look at where that's been bent. Um, all this paint down here that's just chipping off over time. So this is why I like 8x10. I see things in here that I've never, I didn't see when I was standing there outside. I didn't take time to look at it. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll just do fit into view for that. So there we go. So that's basically all I do in Camera Raw is I'll set my white point, my black point first. I might up the exposure a little bit if I think it needs it, and then maybe a little highlights and shadows if it needs it. Um, now this one does a little bit light on this side, so I could say, you know what, maybe what if I take the highlights down a little bit, does that do anything? Yeah, a little bit. It's trying to catch up to me, I think. So, there we go. The big thing is you can see everything is in tone here in our histogram, so I've got what's, you know, everybody's always saying, oh, you need the bell shape. Well, those people, they live in a 18% gray room. <laughs> so... All right, so anyway, so here is our bell shape, if you want to think of it that way. And this just worked out this way. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. So I'm pretty happy with that. So it's all there. We don't have anything clipping. Again, I can always check my whites just one more time just to see if, yeah, we can just, just a little extra there. Yeah, I'll take it down one little scotch. There we go. We'll call that good. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do open image down here. It's going to pass it to Elements. If you're using Photoshop, it'll then pass it to Photoshop. Uh, if you're using Lightroom, then you're already in the Develop module, so that's that. So I got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed with this machine. Um, it pushes these big files around pretty pretty quickly, so I'm pretty happy. All right, so here we have our our negative, our, our base to start with, and generally this is what I do: is I will. Um, the next thing I'll do is I will come up here into the layers panel and I will create a new layer and I will call it, if you double click the, the name of the layer, you can always change the name of it. So I will change it to clone or dust and scratches, whatever it is you want to call it. And what that's going to allow you to do is now with the, and I like the healing brush, that seems to work the best for me. Here's the clone tool. And then of course you have the healing brush tool. And I find that the healing brush tool most of the times gives me a really natural looking patch. So then down here, for example, now obviously if you're in Photoshop, your, your options for the healing brush are on the top of the screen and elements it's just reversed. They put them on the bottom. Why? I don't know. Why can't they stick everything all in one place and just leave it there? All right. What can I tell you? All right. So here's a spot healing brush. So that might work. You might like that. Here's the regular healing brush. And this is where you're going to do your... Um, source and then paint which I'll show you here in a second you can pick your your brush size and here we got the brush settings let me just zoom out of that for a minute and the hardness generally I will start with 50 percent and the reason my thought behind this is if I have this set to 100 percent and I draw it's like taking a pencil or a hard sharpie marker and you draw it and it's like oh you can see the edges and everything which is generally not what you want and if I have a hardness of zero I find it's like taking a piece of wood, throwing it out in your front lawn, and then spray painting it. And yeah, you're going to spray paint the piece of wood, but you're also going to spray paint half your grass, which is not good. So I find with a hardness of 50%, it's like you're still spray painting that piece of wood out in the front lawn, but you're kind of controlling the overspray on the grass, if that makes sense. So I usually leave that around 50. 
the spacing, I don't even mess with that, and the roundness. And then if you have a stylus, you can turn on the pen pressure here if you wish. So that's basically what I use. And I do use a Wacom tablet. I have a, a small and a medium-sized uh, Intruos Pro. They're a great tool. I don't have it with me today, so I'm going to be using the trackpad. But if you're doing a lot of this, I would highly recommend you try using a uh, Wacom tablet. And definitely, they're, they're worth their money. Uh, in the past 20 years, I've um, wore out three of them. So they do last a while. Okay, so our pixel or our brush size, we'll figure that out in a minute. And then the big thing that we want here is you want to make sure that this sample all layers is checked. And what this is going to allow you to do is it's going to read the image, read the data from the background layer, and it's going to then paint on the clone layer. So if I make a mistake or if I try to have to work in a certain area of the photo, and I just really botched the whole thing up and I'm like, ugh, and I didn't notice it after I've saved the file. And then, you know, later, say the next day, I'm like, oh, I just really don't like that. Well, if you don't put this on a separate layer, there's really no good way to go back and fix it unless you want to start over, which we don't want to do. So with, by doing it this way with the clone layer, you can, I could easily go in there with like the eraser tool, for example, and just erase that part of the uh, photo and start over so that's kind of nice so we want to make sure the sample all layers is checked so that's kind of a good thing all right so here's something this is kind of how i work now i'm not going to take you through the whole process it takes me on average anywhere from three to six hours to do a negative like this i'm pretty meticulous and want to make sure that all the dust and scratches is out um, i don't now if it's something's blurry or because it's blowing in the wind like some of this grass might be that's fine i let that go but if it's I have a golden retriever, so if I get a dog hair in there or something like that, sometimes I'll get the black um, little fringes from where you pull the dark slide out. It's that Those will show up in there because obviously they're, they're used, so they might be breaking a little bit. So those are the kind of things I like to get rid of. So I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in here. There's a couple different ways you can zoom in. Uh, you can use the zoom tool and click, and it will zoom you in. I use on the Mac, it's Command Plus. On the PC, it's Control Plus. So I'm just going to go ahead and press that a couple of times, and then I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. So we'll just, um, well, actually, let me get here. So this says 100%. This is actually what I'm looking at here, right down here, 100%. However, I don't work at 100%. I work at 200%. And the reason why I do that is because if I make a little change on some of these things, and it looks good at 200%, nobody's ever going to see it at 100%. And, you know, conversely, if I were to work on this, say, like this, maybe at um, 6% or 12%, and I make a, make a change and it's not doesn't look so hot, it's really going to stick out like a sore thumb at 100%. So that's why I don't mind zooming way in on these um, at 200%. And then basically, I'm just going to scroll up here to the upper left of our negative. And I do have the rulers turned on, so if you don't see those, you can always go to View and then Rulers. And if you don't see a check mark, just click on that. It will then um, show you these rulers. I use these as a guide to know where I'm at. So at 200%, this is where I would then start to get, look at this and go, okay, now let me go ahead and get my uh, healing brush tool again. This is all set up. So we've got a few little spots here, and I find the edges, for me at least, are the worst because that's where... The developers, um, you know, as I'm moving it back and forth, kind of um, gets hung up. And also, the if there's any dust, it seems to want to go to the to the edges. So the edges are always the worst, for, at least for me. And then the middle is pretty clean. So um, in this case, we've got these. It looks like some. This could be uh, dust either from the uh, paper towel. It could be just plain dust from the holder. Um, who knows? But anyway, it's in there. It's got to come out. So. The way I do this, now here's another little tip if you, you may already know this, is the bracket keys next to the P key is in print. You can press the left bracket key. You guys see my brush right there? The left bracket key makes your brush smaller, the right bracket key makes it bigger. So what I do is I try to keep my brush about the size of the thing I'm trying to fix, because if it gets too big, then you might grab something else and it can be a kind of a mess. So basically, I'm just going to press and hold Alt on Windows or Option on Mac and find kind of a clean spot and then just left click with your uh, mouse or your trackpad and then just come right on over here and then just click. 
So I'll just go around the image. And as I move, I'm going to be having one hand on that Option or Alt key. And then I'll just update where I'm going to be and just go around. And this is what we're going to be doing for the next, you know, three to six hours. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you got a long playlist in your iTunes. <laughs> and you can see how it grabbed that, so I could obviously undo that real quick and do a little bit better job on it. If that does happen to you, then this is um, going to be a job for the clone tool. And you want to make sure that the clone tool is also set to sample all layers. And in this case, I want the opacity to be 100% with your um, blending mode of normal. So if I go ahead and just the same thing, bring my brush just a little bit smaller, and I just click, and there we go. I don't have to worry about it grabbing this edge of this uh, leaf here. So, obviously, we're not going to sit here and do this for the next six hours, talk about boring. So, let me just go ahead and put this back to full screen. So, there we go. So, I would then take the time to do that. So, my next step is to add contrast. Uh, you notice I didn't do that in Camera Raw. I always do the contrast at the end after all my edits are finished. That's just the way it works for me. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do this. Uh, one of the ways is you can, I, I don't really use adjustment layers for this, but when I'm finished, I will then save it, this as a copy. Oh, let's talk about saving for a minute. This, so these files are really big. I mean, really big. So now as you can see, now that we're into uh, elements here, let me just show you. We're at uh, 1.9 gigabytes, so 1.2. So here's something I found with working with this 8x10 film. I was saving them in PSD layered format, which is what most people do. But then I got a little warning saying, sorry, you can't do it this way. Um, try again. And I went, what was that all about? Photoshop has, Photoshop file, PSD, has a limit of two gigabytes, which I did not know. So. How do we get around this and how do we keep the layers intact as much as possible? So I found out TIFF will do four gigabytes as a layered file. So that's actually what I'll save this as, is I just go up here to file, save as, and I always do save as first and we'll just call this old garage or gas station actually is what it is. So anyway, we know what it is. All right, so I just throw it on the desktop. And then now here, this is where I'm going to make my change. So if I come on down here, I can then change this to TIFF. And you notice the layers option is still available to us. So that's fine. And then I just click save. Make sure it's, that looks good. We got a desktop, TIFF, layers. Okay. Now when this comes up, image compression, I do none. I don't want any kind of compression. that. Compression is another word for it. let's throw some data out. Not, not for me. Byte order, obviously if you're on Windows, you're gonna do uh, IBM. If you're on Mac, you'll do Mac. And this RLE is what I've been using. It says saves faster, bigger files, so it's fine. So I just go ahead and click OK. And by the time I'm done, my layers are generally, or I should say my files are generally around two to four gig, or uh, yeah, two to four gig with the cloning, depending on how much cloning I have to do, because cloning adds up, it's amazing how much, because uh, you're adding pixels, uh, depending upon what it is you need to fix. So, and the other, th that's why I'll generally have this file uh, at this point, then what I'll do is I'll save a copy, and it'll be a, a flatness and save a copy, and then what I'll do is add my contrast. So as far as the contrast goes, there's a couple different ways you can go. Um, in here, we, now if you're on, Photoshop CC or Photoshop CS6 or CS5, you can use an adjustment curve. And there's one here called curves, which is what I would use. I'm sorry, an adjustment layer. And then inside of there's one called curves. That's what I would use. Um, in elements, we don't have that. So the other thing that we would have to do is go under enhance, uh, adjust color, and then adjust color curves. And I'll try this. We'll see how this here works. So it's trying to load the before and after. But basically the way this works is over here on our left, we have these different presets. And you can just pick one and you'll notice that the curve starts to get this S shape. So it was straight, I just clicked on the um, increased contrast and now we've got the little S curve. And then of course I can come over here and let me just uh, back up here a little bit. So anyway, so let me explain this and then hopefully I can get this all on the screen for you guys. 
So we've got adjust highlights and adjust shadows. So that's the top and the bottom sliders. All right, so now if I take this and I pull this up, do you see how we can kind of accentuate the top of the curve? And then of course we can do the same thing down here at the bottom. Okay, so let's zoom out for a minute. And then let me just go ahead. Now, this is not typically what I use, um, so that's why this is not loading up. I'll just go ahead and click OK and see if it's, oh, actually, you know why I didn't do it? It's because I had my clone layer there, so I need to flatten this first. And then what we'll do is we'll try that one more time real quick and see if it works. Just color curves. Ah, there we go. So now I'll just go ahead and do increase contrast, and then I can go ahead and kind of play with this to whatever looks good. It's just totally your, your, how much contrast you want, you can dial it in there. Um, so everybody's got their own, whatever it is that they like. So it might take it a minute and it will do it. I need to do it already. Ah, there we go, see it did fairly quickly, so that's nice. All right, so the other option that you have is there are some, inside this Color Effects Pro, this is some other things you can do to add contrast. There's a couple tools in there. So find any of these that you like and see what you think to add the contrast. That's what I do. That gives me more, that's why I like to go for a flat negative to start with, with um, the PyroCat and because I know I'm going to be scanning it in this way, I can add as much contrast as I like and I don't have to worry about getting too much in the film to begin with and then trying to pull it out or something like that. I'd always like a very flat negative. So then lastly, what I do, now let's say this is finished and now I'm ready to do something with it. Is I'll, this will be my master file. So I would call this, you know, it's called old station right now, dot tiff. So let's say somebody wanted to buy this and they wanted a eight by 10. Okay, fine. So I would then from this master file, choose my size. Now this one happens to be listed, but if you have a size, let's say for example, 16 by 20, that is not listed. How do we fix that? So if I just come down here and choose no restriction, and then I can put in width 16. And if I hit the tab key, it'll put the IN in for me. There we go. And then we'll just zoom out a little bit. So then I can go ahead and crop. Now I'm gonna crop, I'm gonna use the whole file, the whole negative. So we haven't lost anything, which is great. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually, one other thing I need to fill out before I hit the green checkbox is the resolution. So what number do you stick in here? I have an Epson printer, so what I use is 360 because that is Epson's native printing uh, resolution. If you have a Canon, it's 300. Generally 300 is kind of like the all around works good. So in this case, I'm just gonna put in uh, 360 because that is what my Epson's gonna use. So now I can go ahead and click on the green checkbox and it will crop it and we should be good to go. So there we go. So this is now 16 by 20. And if we wanna check it, I can always go up here to image, resize, image size, and Photoshop, just go to image, image size, and you're, you're there. But here you can see it says 16 by 20 at 360 DPI, that's perfect. So now what I do for sharpening is again, I come back to Nick. By the way, if you haven't heard Nick, uh, probably about a month ago, got bought by DxO, so I'm very excited to hear that. And I'm just gonna go over here to Output Sharpener real quick. And this is how I sharpen all of my photos. And the reason why I like this is, first of all, when you crop your photo and you have the resolution set, the algorithm from the Sharpener Pro is gonna look at that and it's going to apply its algorithm according to what you've cropped it and the resolution you've used, so that's kinda nice. All right, so basically, how do you, if you've never used this before, it's real simple. Uh, you have these different choices. Display is for anything that's going to be viewed online. So that'd be your web, video, uh, Facebook, anything like that. And then you have inkjet. Uh, this is some other stuff that we would use in professional printing. I don't think anybody's doing that, so we won't bother with those. So I will, today we'll pretend that we're going to print this. So I'll do inkjet. And now it's gonna ask you a series of questions. It's gonna say, what's the viewing distance? And everybody I've talked to, either at Nick or other photographers, they say, just leave this alone at auto. It does best at auto. Okay, fine enough for me. Paper type. It's gonna ask you, what, uh, which of these substrates are you gonna be printing on? 
So we've got textured and fine art, canvas, plain paper, matte, luster, and glossy. I like luster. That's what I've come to, after all these years, that's what I've come to be using. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose luster and the printer resolution. Now, my printer will do all different kinds of resolution. However, the one that I have settled on is this 1440. And I've done tests with people. I'll say, which one do you like better? And they go, it looks exactly the same. So I printed some at 28, 4, 2880 by 1440, and I've done some at this 1440 by 720. Again, nobody could tell the difference, but it took so much less time to print this one than it did this one. So for me, it's just not worth doing the 2880. So I go ahead and choose that. So now that I've got these in here, it's already added the algorithm. So if you can see this, this red line that's going down the middle here, there. So this side is the original, this side is the fixed version or the preview of what it's gonna do. So I could just grab this line and then of course I can move this around. And then you have your little navigator down here. So like for example, if I really want to check on the bent pieces down here of those metal and the nails and everything we were looking at. So I'll just put that there for a minute and it's gonna take a minute to update. So there we go. So now we can really see how it's gonna help out any of these um, paint chips and things. So, yeah, so that's, and if you, for whatever reason, you know, if it's too aggressive to you or not aggressive enough, you can change it. So that's what this output sharpening strength does, is sometimes I may pull this down to like 50% and see if that looks, you know, more, you want, you want your image to look sharp, but you don't look like if you touch it, it's going to shatter into a million pieces. So that's um, obviously over sharpening. So again, even that's not bad at 50%. If you want to, you know, split it in the middle at 75-ish, that may not be too bad. So anyway, yeah, there's some other things here like structure. That's, that would make this paint pop out even more, but then it might get a little too, too sharp. And then if your image is slightly and I mean slightly out of focus, they do give you this focus slider here that you can move to the right and try to boost that to fix it. Um, but if you're, for example, if you were shooting a bird in a tree and it missed the bird and went after the tree, your, your autofocus went and hit the, uh, the tree and the bird's completely fuzzy, forget it, it's not gonna, it's, this isn't some magic slider, it's gonna all of a sudden flip the focus around. So, uh, but if it's slightly out, that might help you. So then basically I just click OK, and it's going to process that. You'll notice it's going to add it as a separate layer, which is always nice, so it's totally non-destructive. So there we go. And then at this point, to finish this, I would just do File, Save As again. I always do Save As because then I know where it's going. And then um, I would put it on my hard drive, but in this case, we're just going to throw it on the desktop. And after the file name, this is what I do to kind of keep track is I do underscore and then put in the print size. So I always leave it as a TIFF and that's fine. Click save. And this is all the same here, so that should be fine. And there we go. So if we look on our, let me just go ahead and close this and let's just quit out of this here for a minute. So if we look here on our desktop, what we have is the original TIFF. It looks like the thumbnail needs to be updated. And then here is the fixed one of 16 by 20. So what I will generally do is prepare 8 by 10, 16 by 20, 24 by 30, 32 by 40, and 40 by 50. And you think, who's going to buy all these sizes? So I've been lucky enough that um, somebody saw my work online here in South Southwest Florida. They were an interior design company and they bought 11 of my pieces to put into a, um, I guess it's uh, some kind of big corporation building that they're putting together. So that's kind of nice. So you never know who's going to look at your stuff. But a lot of the pieces they want are like 36 inches or in that neighborhood. So big print. So that's definitely something you might want to think about. All right, so that's about it. If you have any questions or comments, um, leave them down below. I, I read and will respond to every question or comment if there's anything I can help you with. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Uh, if, you, if you do like it, I hope you consider liking and subscribing to keep up on all the uh, crazy adventures that we have here. So thanks again for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.